anything. So. Mm. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet's experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Sharon Goldsmith. Sharon, are you ready to be great today? Yes. Sharon is the Acting Executive Dean of Entrepreneurship and Business Development at Hofstra University. She has 12 years of combined experience in the in business management and entertainment industry with over five years in higher education. <clears throat> for almost three years, she was business manager for recording artists, NBA players, other higher network individuals. Her most famous client, 50 Cent, 50 Cent, has to join GD New Records in 2005 as the Director of Finance and later as the Director of Finance Human Resources. Sharon, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. So this is probably schematics, but why is the title acting and not like interim or just permanent? Like you have to prove yourself to something or like, it's a funny story when I was in the army, like a lot of times like people go on vacation and someone do the job, it'd always be like, you know, you know, so-and-so is acting, whatever, right? I remember this one guy said like, my name, I'm not John Rain. I'm not an actor. Like I'm doing this for real, right? So I'm pretty sure you're doing this job for real, right? You're not acting at anything, right? I am doing the job for real. Um, so Stacy Sykes, who is the former executive dean, resigned back in June. And Hofstra University has a new president who started in August. And so they gave me the acting title until our new president could get acclimated with the university and the work that I do. And we will be revisiting that uh, at the end of the year. So, so what is Stacy going to do? What's Stacy going to go do now? Stacy is the vice president of the Long Island Association. So that is an organization of businesses across Long Island who get together and talk about and uh, lobby for programs and resources that would benefit a better economic development situation on the island. Okay, so more entrepreneurship, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, once you get the bug, it's really hard. To yeah, walk it, away. yeah, it's the disease that does not go away. <laughs> Once you have it, it's hard to get away from it. Absolutely. So what do you what do you do as a new role? So I do a lot of things that I didn't think I'd like, um, and I'm trying to learn to like them. So it is fairly administrative. And what I do is I really look for opportunities, um, grants and other ways to raise money to expand the programming that we offer. You know, the mission of our center is really to grow the entrepreneurial ecosystem, to help small business owners scale and to grow, and to really help our Hofstra students see self-employment as a path for them after graduation. I think when you go to college, you know, you're thinking about, oh, when I graduate, I'm going to get a job. But I have met a lot of people over the years who see self-employment as a much better option, you know, being your own boss and, and creating your own ceiling or lack of ceiling for how much money you're going to make, making your own hours. Um, and while it does sound super glamorous and you put it that way, most of the entrepreneurs I know work 24 seven, um, but it's just the grind and they love it. And when you're doing it for yourself, I think it's, it's easier to justify. Yeah, can you definitely control your outcomes more as an entrepreneur versus you work with someone else, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you know what the end benefit is. Um, you're always going to work harder for yourself. You're more motivated. Um, and not to say I'm not working super hard for Hofstra University, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when you take a job, you're replaceable, right? Like there's always somebody else out there who can do your job. But when you run your own business, pretty hard to replace yourself. So, yeah. Well, imagine how bad an entrepreneur you are if you replace yourself, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it is definitely an exit strategy to bring on a new CEO and, and to eventually be in an advisory role when you're done sort of running the company day to day. But I, I see most entrepreneurs struggle at that point to really have figure out their own identity when, you know, it's like giving away your baby. And you're in New York City, right? So Hofstra University is... Um, just east of New York City. We're about 25, 30 minutes east of the city in Nassau County. Uh, and I live in Queens. So I am born and raised in Queens, which I love to tell people is not only the most diverse borough in the entire city, but arguably one of the most 
diverse places in the entire world. And I think it's just such an incredible experience that I've had growing up there. Um, so many different cultures and uh, ethnicities and learning different languages and eating different foods and, and seeing people's traditions. It's, it's really um, made me see myself as super small and the world is really, really big. Um, and I think it's also been a benefit to me uh, in my journey in higher education, you know, leaving the corporate world and, and moving on to this and being able to at least have some context for where some of our international students come from and what um, what some of their cultures and customs mean and how that affects, you know, how they run their businesses. So trying to really be culturally competent day to day. Um, and I think that's just like a it's a natural progression for a New Yorker um, to be able to, to uh, use their cultural competency and expand the wealth of work that they do every day. I'm probably making this up, but isn't there like a six block area in Queens where like there's like 155 languages spoken or something crazy like that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think about it in terms of like, even in the micro, so forget the macro, which is six blocks, but how about the floor of my apartment building. So that there are, I think, 10 apartments that share an elevator and directly next to me is a couple. They're from Croatia, directly across the hall to gentlemen from China. Um, in the back left corner is a woman from Italy. So just from like when I opened my front door, that's how diverse um, my apartment building is. So forget the six blocks. And it's a uh, I know it's a really different experience than a lot of other people have. And I feel just really lucky and blessed to live that way. So for people who are not familiar with New York City, can you give a quick down or dirty on like the five boroughs, how like everything's different, how's the neighborhood? Because people like New York City, right? But even there's like the Manhattan Bronx, even in Manhattan, there's like the different neighborhoods, right? Can you break that down? Yeah. So New York City is made up of five boroughs uh, and they are Staten Island, which is geographically its own island. You can access it by taking a bridge or taking a ferry and the ferry is free. Um, and then the Bronx is north of Manhattan. So geographically sort of connected to Westchester County. Um, and then Queens is connected to Long Island. So we are Southeast of Manhattan, Manhattan, we are connected to Brooklyn. So it's Brooklyn into Queens, then out to Long Island. And Manhattan's like this tiny island in the middle. And it's funny because New York City is, is geographically kind of small, but um, we're the majority of the population of the state of New York. Uh, Queens is super diverse and not usually seen as trendy or cool. Um, we were the largest by landmass. Um, we have probably the worst public transportation besides Staten Island, where I think if you don't have a car, I don't know how you get anywhere. Um, the Bronx, Brooklyn has seen the most gentrification, at least in my lifetime of living in New York. So Brooklyn had neighborhoods that, I mean, you would not even consider walking off a of main avenue in, in some of the neighborhoods like, like Flatbush and Bushwick when I was a kid. And now, um, you know, the prices of real estate are insane and the gentrific gentrification is real. And it does seem like they're pushing people to the Bronx for a cheaper cost of living when they, they can no longer um, afford Brooklyn. But Brooklyn has a great art scene, a great music scene. Um, and then Manhattan, I guess, if you start Lower Manhattan, so most people will recognize Lower Manhattan because we just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the largest tragedy in my lifetime on our soil, which was 9-11. So there's Battery Park City and then the Wall Street area, Lower Manhattan, where 9-11 happened, um, where the Twin Towers were formally located. Now it's a memorial. Then as you go further north um, on the east side, you have like the East Village and the West Village, which um, the East Village is like a little, I'll say a little more like hipster, a little more grimy. Uh, lots of younger kids after college moved there. Um, cool sneaker culture, cool restaurants. The West Village is a little trendier, a little more expensive. Above that is on the West side is Chelsea, which is um, really expensive real estate. Um, Chelsea and Tribeca are probably the most expensive real estate in Manhattan. Um, Chelsea is a cool neighborhood. It used to 
have, it used to be sort of a bastion of a safe space for the LGBTQ plus community for a while. Um, and do north of that Hell's Kitchen is sort of where a lot of um, that culture migrated. Uh, the Upper West Side and the Upper East Side is uh, lots of strollers and families and an older professionals, more of a quiet area. And then all the way uptown, um, people might be familiar with Washington Heights from the Lynn manuel Miranda film, The Heights, which was uh, based in Washington Heights. And that's like up near Columbia and they have a huge Latin culture there. So lots of Dominican pride and... Um, so that's sort of my take on, <laughs> on New York and the boroughs. I mean, there's uh, some famous things in the Bronx that I love to do. And I think the borough just doesn't get enough love. So I'd recommend people who are coming to the Bronx that if you come to New York City, like don't just visit Manhattan. I think the boroughs really offer something special. So the Bronx has um, amazing Italian food and they have the Bronx Zoo, which is awesome, and the Botanical Gardens. Um, Queens has the former site of the World's Fair. So there's this like huge sphere in the middle of an amazing park and the parks in Corona, Queens, which has um, a lot of Mexican descendants and incredible Mexican food if you like tacos um, or tortas. So I always try to encourage people when they're visiting New York, um, you know, the Statue of Liberty, the Empire State Building, sure. But like, if you want to live like a real New Yorker and you really want to check it out, you, you want to sort of expand out into the boroughs and see, you know, how we live regularly on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's nothing like the uh, influencers show you on TikTok. <laughs> now, you always hear like there's a, there's a Times Square in New York City and there's a real New York City, right? I try to avoid Times Square. <laughs> um, it's. It's interesting, the city has made this effort to get rid of cars in Times Square. So now there's like a whole bunch of seating area, but it's very commercial. Um, it isn't terribly far from the theater district. So, you know, a lot of people come to New York to see the theater, which is really important. And we just had a big reopening of the theater, which is excellent. Um, that's great for, you know, the economic health of New York City and also for the arts, but but it, it is right, right next to Times Square. and. Uh, you know, it has a lot of stores you would probably find in your local mall, like an M&M store and you know, commercial and chain restaurants. And so it's, I guess if you want to see like the lights <laughs> um, and the advertisements or where the ball drops, you might want to pass through real quick. But I, I can't tell you any uh, native New Yorker who would choose to get off at that subway stop. <laughs> Nice. I know one thing in Bronx I was reading, cause I know there's like a little Italy in Manhattan, but then the little Italy in Bronx, they claim they're the real little Italy, right? So it's like a kind of like a competition between those two little Italy's, like who's the real one? <laughs> the one in Manhattan has been shrinking um, dramatically over the years. And that's also a product of gentrification and just the neighborhood changing and the diversity of the neighborhood changing. Um, there's a large Chinatown Asian population that's sort of like encroached and pushed closer in and um, they've both been around for a really long time and I think it's just a more um, authentic New York experience to get out of Manhattan and check out the Bronx so yeah and then we're gonna, nice. and we're gonna talk about hip-hop later on but isn't isn't Bronx the place that there's a park in Bronx that's like the, the actual birthplace of hip-hop right that you can go see well, as a Queens girl, I like to think that Queens is really the home of hip hop. Uh, <laughs> okay. The originators of Run DMC, uh, you know, LL Cool J, you know, we had really early hip hop in Queens. And so uh, Jamaica Queens to me is sort of where, where hip hop got started. Okay, nice. Interesting. Um, so what is entrepreneurship to you? What does that even mean? That's a loaded question. <laughs> I'm not so sure I'm gonna give the best answer, but I think uh, to me, it is problem solving. And the best entrepreneurs I know solve a super relatable problem that a lot of people experience. Um, it's, it's solving a problem and creating something that people want. So, I mean, there's many entrepreneurs, there's small business owners, there's founders. I think there's a difference between the two of them, right? 
But regardless of, uh, uh, we're just talking about entrepreneurship. From, from your experience at Hofstra and what you do there, and we're talking about how we met in a minute, are, do you see any certain characteristics that founders have that make them successful? Um, I think the ones willing to take the most risk are the ones that see the most reward. Like this is not easy. There is no like instruction manual for, Hey, you want to start your own business? You're just going to like check a bunch of boxes and go through uh, steps one through 10 and you're going to kill it. Uh, you know, it's ever evolving. It's ever changing and you have to just be really ballsy. Right. So it's like taking that big risk. And then it's also being okay with constant change because nobody told us that we were going to live through a global pandemic. Nobody warned us for, you know, all of that change so quickly that everybody would be working from home and that, you know, if you were a, an owner of a store that depended on people to go to an office park or to go to, you know, a certain section of town where it was all commercial, like nobody prepared you for how you were going to have to change. And so the really successful entrepreneurs love change. They're happy about it. They're excited about it. They're constantly iterating. And so, um, so being ballsy and being excited about change, seeing change as opportunity instead of problems. Uh, those are the ones that are the most successful. I remember seeing a meme a long time ago. It said, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, do this. Like step one, start a business. Step two, get customers. Step three, raise $10 million. Step four, get a car for a million. Step five, Realize this will never fucking happen to you. you know? <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, we all wish it was that easy. And, you know, I think we've, we've created this like glorified culture of what it is to be an entrepreneur. And we put people like Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg on this pedestal. And we say like, oh, here's amazing entrepreneurs. And, you know, you're just going to do it like them. You're going to like drop out of college. You're going to like raise all this money and you're, you're just going to have this exponential growth. And, you know, it's raising money is not always right for every business. No, uh, not, taking and, on. Yeah. Not only that, like, I think only 1% of companies raise money and there's no guarantee that's going to you know, make successful. Like the most, most famous one recently, like I think it was Quibi out of Chicago, raised like $400 million and they failed in six months. So like, how do you fail with $400 million in six months? Like, like what kind of run rate do they have, right? Um, I mean, I wonder how the New York City MTA can't get their shit together when you've got millions of New Yorkers riding the subway every day and paying $3 a pop, like over and over and over again, guaranteed customers. So I guess the amount of money coming in or the amount of money in your bank account is, is not always going to be an indicator of success. Um, I think that you can blow through money really quickly. You can spend it really, really fast on making really poor hires. You can spend it really, really fast on having a whole bunch of inventory or, you know, make the rebuilding a bunch of software features that no one wants. And so, you know, I mean, look at WeWork. You can just set money on fire if, <laughs> if you really want to. Uh, but some successful businesses that I'm aware of never borrowed a dollar, raised a dollar, you know, they started with scratching together whatever few thousand dollars they could on credit cards. Um, and they really had to, because they ran their company so lean, rely on generating the cash flow to keep the thing alive. And while the growth is slower um, and the scalability isn't, you know, that quick, trying to get a return um for your investors, if that's your priority and no longer solving the problem and no longer taking care of your customers, you know, it, it's no wonder you're failing. You're taking your eye off the prize and, you know, you're tell the investors put their money in the stock market, try to make the money, you know, try to make your own money. And, and then you can call your own shots and really learn how to make the business profitable. Cash is king. It will always be king. If your if your business is turning a profit and you're bringing in cash, then maybe it's a good time to take on investment when you already know how to make it work. So um, you, you see lots of companies, you know, at what you do right now, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business ideas. And if I ask a question, like we'll go back in time, like if you go back in 2010 and someone said, hey, um, I'm gonna pay you hundred dollars to let somebody sleep in your, your, your spare bedroom. People would say, you're crazy, right? I'm not doing that. Or 
hey, I'm going to have this random stranger pick up your teenage daughter and drive her somewhere. You would say, no way, right? But now they'll both be in dollar businesses. Having said that, what do you do or what's your advice to people? You see, you see a business idea, you're like, I don't know about this. Like someone came to me and said, <laughs> if someone came to you and said, hey, I'm going to sell snow cones and ice cream in um, Homer, Alaska in <laughs> December, right? Of course, you don't never want to crush somebody's dream because you never know what they're doing. But how do you approach that? As a wintertime snowstorm ice cream eater. Um, so, I they have a, they have a, so they have a customer with you? <laughs> I can tell you no idea is too crazy. Uh, but I think it's really about the process of customer discovery. And I'm really evangelical about this idea that you need to go out there before you launch your business and talk to all your prospective customers. You need to ask them a lot of questions. You need to say, think in your head, what is the problem that you think you're solving? And then ask them, do they identify with that problem? And if they do, how are they currently solving it? And what do they like about the solution they're using? And what do they not like? And you really try to figure out that sweet spot of differentiation. Now, if you talk to a hundred people and you can't find any prospective customers for your business, I would hope the alarms go off in your head and you would say, all right, maybe I'm not doing the right thing. But in terms of companies that had pretty wacky ideas like Airbnb and Uber and Lyft, um, you know, they proved the concept and they proved it early. Uh, so if you can find customers and prove the concept with a minimally viable product. It doesn't have to be beautiful and fancy and have all the bells and whistles, uh, you know, at the most rudimentary state of, of what your business will be or could be. If you can get some customers and bring in some cash and prove that it, it works, um, you know, no matter how crazy it sounds, people will believe you. People will get behind you because you proved it. Can you talk about how you do customer discovery? It probably should not be your mother or father or best friend. <laughs> Like, it should probably like be random strangers. Well, my my mother is very honest, um, which has caused a lot of tears and and maybe a few trips to the psychiatrist if she's watching. Hi, mom. But most people don't have a mother like mine, so I think um, customer discovery. You really need to figure out who, at least in your head, you think your customer is. Is it another? Is it other businesses or people? Um, and then you, strangers, strangers who do not know you, who have absolutely no stake in this going forward are your target. Um, and people hate talking to strangers, especially the younger generations. They're super uncomfortable, um, but this will save you time and this will save you money and this will save you a lot of heartache. So you go out and you talk to the strangers, have a set list of questions. Um, I always say, Start with your value proposition. What is the problem you're solving? What are you trying to accomplish? So if you were thinking about launching a hot dog stand, you would go out and ask 20, 30 people when you're hungry and you're you know, in a rush or you don't have a lot of money in your pocket, what do you do? Where do you go? Why do you go there? What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? And try to figure out at least at that point, you know, where are other people getting a snack when they're hungry? Where are they going? So that you know how far away from their house they're going, if they're getting something healthy, how much they're spending. So you know if this is like even a reasonable idea. And then I start to move into, and I tell people important to move into things like, how much are you willing to spend to solve the problem you have? So if I'm hungry and I'm on like on the go and I ask you how much you're willing to spend to solve that problem, you know, if your answer is like $2, I don't know if you're going to be able to make a profit selling hot dogs. If the answer is like 20 bucks, then maybe I should be selling a hell of a lot more than hot dogs because I could probably get them for like a side of fries, a Coke and some other things. Um, and so that really helps you figure out if you are charging the right amount of money. And I always tell people, if you're, if you're solving someone's problem and they've had this problem for a while and it's really going to save them time and save them money, you're probably not even charging them enough. You could probably get, you could probably charge them more. Uh, and so that's sort of the, the process of customer discovery. And you want to think about, um, I always use the business model canvas as sort of the backbone of it. So you've got, you know, the boxes of the business model canvas, and it makes you think about each, and you can find that on strategizer.com. If anyone who's listening is curious, think about each individual part of the business and then go out there and ask these strangers these questions. And you should start collecting these strangers' email addresses because if you start getting the answers that you wanna hear, that you 
are going to be impactful for your business, those are your future customers that you're going to then email in your soft launch. Maybe it'll be your early adapters. Um, and it's when you're doing customer discovery, while you are talking to strangers, the other thing you really need to do is listen. Because if you let people talk, they will tell you a lot more than just what you're asking. Um, and it's in those patterns in the conversations and it's the repetition that you hear from one person to another about how they're solving that problem and what works and what doesn't work that you're really going to get that magical aha moment that gives your business direction. So what's your advice on this, right? So I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they do what you say, right? And then, you know, like you said, a lot of people don't like talk to people. So they're asked the questions and the, and the people will say, this is a great idea. I like it a lot. You know, everything's positive, very positive, but is that really true feedback or just saying stuff to get you out your hair and get them, you get your hair, right? How do you, as an how do you tell that this is really good feedback or this like trying to get rid of you, right? A lot of times people say, oh, this is a great idea. <laughs> this so is a idea. if you're doing customer discovery, right, they should never know what your business idea is. You should never give them, this is my plan. This is what I'm going to do. It should just be about asking questions about the problem that your business solves. So I think since you're not telling them what you're going to do and you never bring that up, um, at least in your initial customer discovery, they're going to be honest, right? Like what do they have to lose by telling you, you know, oh, I, you know, I cobbled together like Excel and then these other spreadsheets to solve my problem. And you're like, oh, like, well, if a software did that for you, how much would you pay for that? You know, why would someone lie? If it saves yeah. them a bunch of time, they would be honest. And so I, yeah, I'm sure there's some percentage of people that just want to get you out of their hair. Um, but if you do a hundred interviews, that's like what I think is, at least that's what uh, the magical customer discovery number or recommendation is according to uh, Lean Launchpad, then um, you, you should be able to weed that out and hear the patterns. So you've mentioned business model canvas, this last we just said, are there any other entrepreneur tools you can recommend? So I doubt business model canvas on strategizer.com is sort of like your starting point. I think that's really the best tool to get you organized and then working on your customer discovery is always what I would say is step two. And then this is not really a tool. This is like what I would recommend your next step is. And again, like, let's just remember the meme, right? <laughs> These are not magical keys to success. This is just how you really work through your ideation would be to build your minimally viable product. So I don't care how ugly your prototype is. I don't care how cobbled together it is. If the back end is like a PayPal account and the front end is a WordPress site. And like, somehow that is what your business could be. Um, you know, and go out there and try it. You know, there's no risk in giving it a go and just proving the concepts. I think the risk happens if you spent way too much time building out this platform that then no one wants to use and spending all this money on development. And then now you're just sitting on a pile of debt. So, so business model canvas, step one, customer discovery, step two, build a minimally viable product, and then go prove your concepts. And then after you've done that, you know, it's, it's getting people to come along on the ride with you, right? Like it's real hard to build a business completely alone. Everybody has their strengths. And on the other side of that coin, you know, we all have weaknesses. We all have things that are just not, you know, the primary driver or skill set. And so trying to find either a co-founder or an early employee who really believes in what you're doing and is passionate about solving that problem as you are, that has those complementary skills is, is important. So I'll do one caveat. Your back end as an end doesn't matter as long as your back end isn't like a Walgreens doing blood tests for you, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think her case started. Yeah, it's going, it's, yeah it's, going, it's going on right now, yeah. yeah. She's trying to claim like mental abuse from her partner or something as a defense, right? So that's be interesting to watch, but that's another subject. <laughs> It's like a, the soap opera of entrepreneurship or like the tabloid of entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, companies have been selling snake oil since the start of times. Um, yeah. That's not new. Uh, but like 
has, has anyone else raised that much money to sell their snake oil? Is, that is was a lot of money. Like, yeah. And so that many just, people got duped. And that just, again, goes to show you that going out there and raising money is just not always the answer. <laughs> no, it's not. So as an entrepreneur, do you need to be innovative or does innovation a separate thing from entrepreneurship? So it's a little tricky. I know really innovative people that are terrible entrepreneurs. And I know really good entrepreneurs that are not doing anything innovative, right? So like, is it innovative to make a shirt that's not meant to be tucked in? Is, I mean, we've been not tucking in shirts for a really long yeah, time, that, right? All, all of us are innovative. Because that's all you got to do to be innovative. <laughs> that's not that innovative, but it's great entrepreneurship. It's fantastic entrepreneurship. Company like that is doing tremendous amount of sales, great advertising. It's it's easy to understand. So so there's an example of something that I don't think is is overly innovative, right? And then you meet, and I work at a university, so I meet a lot of these like fantastic, innovative people working in laboratories, solving the world's problems coming up with a vaccine for a global pandemic. Now that doesn't make them great entrepreneurs, right? Not every person who comes up with super, something super innovative wants to be the CEO of a company and understands how to grow and how to scale. Like they're not always passionate about that. And so to the people who are super innovative, they usually don't like or want the, the CEO role. I always tell them like, there is no shame in hiring somebody who loves to be a CEO, who just likes to grow and scale businesses, who can take all your innovations and make it run. Because if your joy is in the lab and your joy is you know, tinkering and, and building things, spending any of your time on like payroll or <laughs> like finding employees is such a waste of your time. It's taking away time from the things that you could be creating. And so it's, it's a tricky balance. There's, I think, a real small percentage of our population who are super good at both. Um, and, you know, thank God for them. Thank God for people who are innovative. Thank God for, you know, all these problem solvers who are entrepreneurs, because, you know, that's, that's how we have progress in this country and the world. Like, that's why life has changed so dramatically. I have a 97 year old grandfather. And the fact that like his life started out without cable TV, without like any of the innovations. And now like he knows how to use a cell phone and, and do Google searches and pay his bills online. Like his life has changed so much. The fact that we could, you know, do a FaceTime call. The first time he saw that, it was like, he could not believe it. And it, when I think about, the, the progress and the change that he's seen in his lifetime, it just makes you so grateful for the people who, who are good at this stuff and, and have those visions. Like I, yeah, I'm just not that creative, <laughs> but I'm in awe of the people who are. So from your perspective, does it matter if a company is a solo founder or co-founder? Does that really make a difference? I know a lot of investors will only invest in co-founding co companies. Well, I guess you're in a lot of trouble if something happens to your founder and you're the only one, right? Like you're the only guy running the show and then you're waiting for a taxi cab and a bad storm and a rainy New York city night, you get hit and you're laid up for a few months. Like if I'm an investor, yeah. Like who's going to be running the company? What's going to happen to my money? And that's that, that's that horrible pressure that you have and you take on outside money is that, you know, you're really in debt to those people and you have a responsibility to them. I've seen businesses work both ways. Um, you know, it really depends again on the skill set of the founder. If the founder can do the job of running the company and also the job of coming up with a creative side of the product, and then I guess it works. Um, you know, it's it doesn't always have to be a co-founder, but what about like a really strong founding team? Your C-suite has to be super solid, right? Like I I think it's really impossible to be good at everything. And so if you don't have at least one or two people sitting around you with complementary skills, I think it's just going to be a harder hill to climb. Now, again, since there's no checklist and there's no magic, I'm sure there is 
there are plenty of people out there who are running businesses that are killing it and they're doing it all alone. Um, so, so who knows? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. And one thing we don't talk about, you know, you want to talk about the hop entrepreneurship. You don't talk about, you know, you have to spend like all day going through receipts, doing taxes, all the, like I call echo biter stuff, right. That, you know, you don't want to do what you have to do to run your business. And they don't know, no one talks about that. I meet people and this is all the accountants out there who are listening, you're going to start cringing, but I meet people who get an idea and they get so excited about it and they just start running the business out of their personal bank account. And they just start putting crap on their credit card and they just, and then they are, they're like getting lots of business and they're just depositing the checks into their personal bank account. And now they are the business and the business is them, right? There's no corporate veil. There's no separation. Um, you know, there is, there is no protection for that person. And then your accountant's head spins around tax time when you have all this revenue and you're you just dump, it, dump everything on them here, fix this for me. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and that'll cost you a lot too. And, and also the accountant's going to have a lot of questions. So it's time suck, but you know, it happens to a lot of people and it's, um, it's unfortunate. You know, I always try to encourage entrepreneurs go get a QuickBooks certification, like at the most elementary, have a basic elementary understanding of like how to have a profit and loss statement that actually represents what you're doing, like how to organize and do some financial forecasting. If you, you need to at least know how it works. Um, you don't have to do it every day. You can outsource it. You can hire somebody to do it for you, but at least have an understanding of it because you also can't claim ignorance if it's your LLC, if it's your company and you didn't do a good job of that and you hired somebody and they didn't do a good job of that, you can't say, well, I didn't really know. It's not a good defense. And it's, if they did something criminal, it doesn't hold up in court. So, you know, being a business owner has responsibilities and you have to play by the rules or the IRS will find you, the government will find you, you know? So I think it is, yeah, it's angle by your stuff. Yeah, it's miserable. Nobody wants to like sit there and separate receipts, but you better know what's a legitimate business expense and what isn't. Your kid's private school tuition cannot be paid out of your company. <laughs> uh, that's just not how it works here in America. So, uh, so it's, you know, those fundamentals, which are so not um, exciting or, or driving the passion of most creative and excited entrepreneurs that I meet are so vital to their long-term success. So, you know, if you have like a business development center, or you have like a local, you know, some, the Small Business Association of America, they have tons of programs. And I would say like, go learn, just go learn so that you don't make any huge mistakes. Yeah, like you said, like you never see Elon Musk or Gary Vaynerchuk doing an Instagram live. Uh, I'm doing my taxes right now and figuring out who to, <laughs> who to hire, you know, like, or oh, here's my financials, who's my PL. You never see that, right? I think that at one point they probably watched that stuff really closely. You know, I'm sure in the beginning, when every dollar mattered, um, uh, they were they were paying close attention. Now they have an army of people who you know, they can rely on who do that stuff for them. I'm sure they use, you know, very expensive big four accounting firms. I'm sure Ernst & Young has it under control and, and they're a reliable place to do business or something like that. But, um, but when you're starting out and every dollar matters, you know, you, you better pay attention to that stuff. And, and that's really how you understand your cash flow and you understand your burn rate. So your burn rate is how much cash you need coming in so that you don't run out, right? Like that's the simplest explanation. How fast is cash burning in your business? And so, you know, if you don't have enough cash flow to make payroll, people aren't going to show up to work. And when they don't show up to work, your customer is not going to get what you promised them. And then they're not going to be your customer anymore. And then what happens to your business? And it's such a domino effect, right? And so the only way to prevent it is to be hyper vigilant um, and, and know the boring stuff. Yeah. And if you don't know your burn rate, I, I, I'm guessing no investor will ever invest in you if you don't know your burn rate. <laughs> no, I would, I would venture to say probably not. <laughs> so next, talk about the importance of, of storytelling for a CEO and for a company, how important that is, like storytelling, branding, all that kind of stuff. So, 
some people are good at it, right? Some people are natural storytellers. And I think they are able to get people to invest in their companies super easily. Um, but I think the most important aspect of being a good storyteller is telling your customers what you do and how you're going to change their life, right? Um, it was probably pretty hard for companies, large ones like Airbnb and Uber to be effective storytellers in the beginning, because I would imagine people were shouting like stranger danger, like absolutely not. Am I getting, I've been telling my kids if somebody has candy in a van run the other way. Like I've been indoctrinated to say that that is wrong and no, um, let a stranger in your house. No, you don't even open the door to the stranger. You let them knock and you're like, leave a note. We're not home. Yeah, I mean, come on. So, you know, it's trying to explain to your customers what you do and why they need you is just the most important story you tell. And you do that through marketing and you do that through branding and effective marketing and branding, um, you know, can really make or break your business. I meet people who have really fantastic products, but they do a really lousy job of letting people know that they exist, first of all, and then why their product is better than everyone else's. And it's that differentiation. Like you go into a supermarket and there's like, you know, 50 breakfast cereals, they're all sugar. Like that's like corn and sugar, right? Like that's basically the makeup of every single one of them. And so they're not all that different, but it's who did a better job enticing you into that grocery store. Who's done a better job with the packaging to make you want to eat it. Um, and you know, and some people tell bad stories. So Kellogg recently got in some trouble. There's a class action lawsuit. If you bought a box of smart start, cause you thought it was healthy, you can get your money back. Um, and so, you know, telling a story that's authentic and true is also super important. Um, and not only for, for having a long-term relationship with your customer so that the lifetime value of each customer that you acquire through your marketing efforts and your hard work um, stays with you and that they trust you. You know, I think Johnson and Johnson had at one point had a, a very bad PR problem. This was before my lifetime, but it's a case study in business school that I think they teach and everyone should know is that some kids got into the Tylenol and they took a whole bunch and they got super sick. And they said, basically, if you have, you know, these bottles laying around in your house, we will give you a full refund. And they changed the cap. And now, you know, you got to like push down really hard and spin around so that like little kids can't get into medicine. Um, and that was super important for them. And that they lost a ton of money on that. But the CEO made a really calculated and smart move that if we were going to be the brands on all of your household products in your bathroom and, and we wanted to have a long-term trustworthy relationship with you, you know, we have to make good on the bad. And it was through that messaging that they became, you know, reliable, um, reliable enough that people are, you know, we're okay with their name being on a vaccine that people are taking now. So I think um, it's really important that your message is, is true and authentic and that and that you always put your customer first. So, you know, it sounds like so cliche, you know, oh, the customer's always right. Well, yeah, the customer's right because without the customer, you don't exist. So yeah, the customer hates a break it to you, but the customer's always right. So you bring a good point. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs or startup founders, especially in the Czech world, that like product, 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 it might be the best product ever, but then, you know, no one knows about it. And a lot of, <laughs> a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, especially non-tech founders, they market, market, market. And there's like, you know, product to sell, right? How do you recommend entrepreneurs like make sure everything is like grown at the same time? Like kind of like a sinking the product and the market together versus being off balance. I'd be super rich if I had a really good answer for that. <laughs> um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of it is trial and error. I think a really complicated number for entrepreneurs to get to is what does it cost me to acquire a customer? right? That customer acquisition cost. And once I acquire that customer, what's the lifetime value of that customer? So if, you know, if you're a tech company and it costs you a lot of money to acquire, 
you know, enterprise software, it costs you a lot of money to acquire a new business and onboard them. And you have to build special features for them and, and integrate into their whole system. So maybe it's really expensive to get one customer, but the lifetime value of that customer, you know, is, is quadruple that. So it's really just about math, right? If you're spending a lot of money and you're not getting a lot of results, there's obviously an imbalance in your mathematical equation. So I would say be intentional with your marketing and, and try to get some earned media, right? Like purchase media is fantastic. You can buy all the ads you want and some of them will convert better than others. And you'll be able to like AB test your ads and say, Ooh, A is converting better than B. I'm going to put all my money in A. And maybe your conversion rate is 2% and you think you're killing it. Um, but if you have a really unique story about you as a founder and how you came to this business idea and, or maybe your business gives back to the community or provides jobs for an underserved population, your local news station would love to run a story about that. You know, every lo local news station is looking for human interest pieces to share. And so spending a lot of your time trying to get that public relations earned media by just being a good citizen and being a good business owner and having ethical um, practices in your company and sharing that story about you and, and how you're a good neighbor and how you're, you're doing right for the community. People will run those stories and there will be a lot of eyeballs and there will be a lot of interest and those stories will convert to customers. And so I always tell people, you know, when possible, where possible, you know, try to secure that in, in the, you know, always because it's free, right? It's free and it pays tremendous dividends. Um, and writers on all these blogs, on all of the, you know, everyone's looking for content. Content is king. People make all of their money on creating content. And what do you need for content? You need stories, you need products, you need something for people to talk about. So trying to, to really capitalize on that, I think is, is a great free trick to, to making sure you're sort of doing this. <laughs> so if you're an entrepreneur, you know, you're, people will tell you, Marketing is the most important thing. Sales is the most important thing. Product, all, everything is the most important, you know. Everything. But, but everything, it doesn't mean so many hours a day. How do you recommend entrepreneurs like st structure their day every day? Um, well, I recommend them not to structure their day by working morning, noon, and night. Um, you have to have some time for self-care. If you're not sleeping, you're going to make some really poor mistakes. If you're not taking care of yourself and you're unhealthy, you're not going to be sharp and effective in your decision making. So um, I think making sure that you take time out for the people you love, for yourself, for your health um, is really, really important. And I see entrepreneurs who just want it so bad, they want it to work so bad that they just burn the candle at both ends. And you know, it's, young people can have heart attacks too. Young people can have strokes too. You know, you're not invisible because invincible because you're young. Um, you may think you're healthy because because you uh, used to work out a lot, but if you're sitting at a desk all day, you know, it's it, it, this is not a healthy position to be. You got to get up and take a walk. So I always, you know, try to preach. You know, if you take better care of yourself, you'll be able to take better care of your business. Um, always checking in with the people who you work, who work for you. I think really good entrepreneurs and the, the founder of 1-800-Flowers, who's a Hofstra alum, talks about this in, um, in a lot of the, the discussions he has about what made his, his business work. And he said that he would leave his office and he would spend time just sitting with employees of like, all different levels of the company, like the customer service person, the person in procurement, getting the flowers, the person in marketing and say like, what do you think would make the company better? What do you think would be, you know, an improvement in your workflow? Like, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And I think, you know, the people who are executing, you know, you might be like running your business from this ivory tower in your big fancy glass office, but the people who are executing for you day to day, they know your business and they know their department and they know their day-to-day -day job better than you could ever know. Um, and listening to them and respecting them and spending time getting to know them and getting to know 
what their opinions are could really help you and help your company. And so I'd say like trying to carve out some time for that is important. And I also think if you make people feel like their voice is heard and you make people feel respected for the work that they do, they're going to work harder for you. Definitely. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's like that in your Times article that says there's like a magical amount of money. And after that, like money doesn't bring happiness. But I think there, you know, you can't quantify feeling respected at work by a number, but you certainly know when you go home at night, whether or not you feel good about going back there the next day. Yeah. I think yeah. the number is 70,000 was I came up with 70,000 is, is like the perfect number. <laughs> and after that, it's like just diminished returns. It doesn't matter if it's 70,000 or 125,000. It's just, you know. Yeah. Well, try, try living in New York city on 70,000. <laughs> yeah. Or Seattle or San Francisco right. or Austin, Texas now. Yeah. Yeah, so I, they might want to revisit that magical number. So this is by my head. I remember Elon Musk did an interview a while ago, right? The interview, like he, like, it was like a great week for Elon Musk. Like he, like, his SpaceX had like two successful launches. They came back and landed perfectly. Tesla was like rolling. Like everything was doing touch of gold, right? And so I got interview him. I can't remember who it was. So, hey, Elon, man, this must have been a great week for you. You know, just this great for you. How are you feeling? Elon Musk, you know, if I'm honest, my life sucks right now. Like your life sucks. Yeah. And Elon booked out all the things he had to do to get the point. Right. And you don't often don't see that, right. All the, all the suck you have to do, like all the late nights, sleep in the factory, all the stuff he does. Of course he like superhuman. He's probably a freaking alien. Right. Versus compared to the rest of us. Right. But the point was like, you know, it, it sucks sometimes. Right. We don't recognize that sometimes. I, the journey, the journey is difficult, right? Like everybody is really excited to celebrate your success, but no one's like super excited to celebrate the grind with you. Um, yeah, I remember I heard um, the owner of Kind Bar speak and he was talking about how like at one point he was living in a studio apartment with, in Manhattan and he had like boxes of granola bars like stacked to the ceiling and he was like walking sideways like an episode of Hoarders trying to get to the bathroom and like th like that that was his life and like could you imagine like you like Hey, buddy, like, let's go for a drink. And you show up to his apartment and like, that's what you see when she just, you'd be like, mm, I'm not feeling so well. <laughs> like this guy's a psycho with his boxes. I think I'll be out. So I think it's, um, you know, the journey is really, is really hard. And I think we have to stop glamorizing, you know, what, what this is. And I think we have to start respecting how hard it is to achieve this stuff, um, and I just have, I have so much respect for people who, you know, run their business and respect their employees and trying to like get, not only making yourself like a financial success, but trying to also make a financial successful situation for, you know, as many of your employees as possible, like trying to create jobs that are sustainable, um, you know, that should really be a benchmark of success just as much as you know, taking your company public or, or selling your business for a lot of money. It's like, well, I created, you know, wealth and, and 10 more millionaires besides myself. Like that should be sort of what we celebrate um, and glamorize the most because that has the most widespread impact, right? Like if you can make a lot of your employees wealthy um, you're and you're creating all of these new jobs, you're creating all this tax revenue, you know, that betters the schools in the neighborhood and that helps out, you know, the coffee shop and the local guy who, you know, fixes your car down the street. Like ever, there's just more money to spread around um, in your neighborhood and, and to trickle down into your local main street businesses. And so I think um, I'd like to see a little more celebration of people who do that. And uh, Dan Price on Twitter, and if you follow him. Yeah, I'd yeah, follow him. Yeah. A guy out here in Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. He, you know, decided that he should pay all his employees, a, uh, you know, a living wage. And like, somehow that's so revolutionary. And he's become like, you know, iconic because he decided, gee, I should just pay the people who work really hard enough money to pay their own damn bills. And like, shockingly, it's worked out really well for his company. And I just like the fact that anyone is surprised by all of that blows my mind and tells you sort of how far off the mark we've gotten from, from what's important about the kind of work that entrepreneurs do. Yeah. One thing when I realized when I talk about either, like when you start a company, I like suppose you to hire 10 people, right? You're not just taking care of those 10 people, you're taking care of their families too, right? I think a lot of times we forget, like you, you hire like Jason Cabinets, you're taking care of me, my wife, my two kids, you know, and we often forget that we just, oh, we're just hiring the person. 
No, you're, t- you're hiring the whole family from us, right? And we, I think we don't, reali- don't realize that enough. It's a tremendous responsibility and they should feel the weight of that responsibility with every business decision that they make. Um, because that's what's going, those people are the people who are there for you and you want them to be happy um, and you want them to support your business and you want them to come to work motivated and to be productive. Uh, And so really, you know, concentrating on that and you're 100% right. People need time to have personal relationships. People need time to spend with their kids because if your employees are stressed out because they don't get to decompress or they're upset because they're missing their kid's soccer game, then they're not giving you a hundred percent. And having their ass in that chair is super counterproductive for everybody. They're there and they're barely giving you anything and they're upset. Um, and, and now you're, you know, not happy because you had to have this awful conversation where you're like, no, you can't go see your kid's soccer game. Like what? No one feels good about that. And so, you know, I think it's really important to think about, and now, employees having the upper hand. Oh my God, the job market has, has really flipped this yep. idea on its head. What, what, and what they call it the great resignation resignation. And you see it everywhere. You know, people are, are leaving their jobs that they don't feel appreciated at. People are leaving their jobs that they don't have flexibility to do things like see their wife and kids and, and make their own hours. Some people are just rejecting going back into the office because you know, spending two and a half hours commuting back and forth every day is just stressing them out and not making them happy. Uh, there's got to be something to be said about the fact that we had like, at least in New York City, seen the effects of removing commuting on the environment. We had, you know, the aquatic life in the East River um, was ridiculous. We had like dolphins and whales and the sky was like bright blue and like New York has never looked or smelled that good. Uh, in my entire lifetime and my parents' lifetime, they're native New Yorkers. And so I think, you know, we also have a responsibility to our planet. Um, if we think we're going to make sustainable businesses and these sustainable businesses are going to be around for a long time, uh, they have to be able to, to work and they need resources to do that. And so I think, you know, when you're thinking about, oh, we've got to drag all our employees back into the office. Well, like, do you? And is that responsible? I don't know. I don't, there's no magical answer. I think it's right for some places. It's not right for others. I work at a university. We have students, students need, you know, that one-on-one interaction. Students need that social setting. You know, you can't really teach a bio lab or a chemistry (laughs) lab through a computer. I don't want to go to a hospital where a doctor or a nurse went to medical school on the internet. Like I'm not comfortable with that. And I don't think anyone should be. So of course there are situations where it's not applicable, but you know, have you got like a really killer salesperson who spent most of their time out at meetings anyway, having their ass in the chair in your office. I mean, I don't know. Is that like, maybe that's just like for ego. Like you need to see your minions. Yeah. Um, maybe <laughs> I have 10 people working, maybe see their 10 computer screens at all times. <laughs> that's so creepy. I I would never work for a place that like tracked me. I, although, you know, you got one of these, you're being tracked yeah, you're anyway. Tracked, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it's been fooled over and over again. Even you like work 40 hours of work a week in a workplace, you actually only work at 15 hours a week, right? Cause like you're on Facebook, you talk to people, you're on the bathroom, you're going on lunch, like how, how much work you're actually doing out of the 40 hours, right? It's not, you're not doing 40 hours of work. I could not believe how productive I was at home. Like, first of all, they got more hours out of me for sure, which I was like then at the end starting to be a little more conscious of like, wait a second, like I didn't get a lot more money, so I shouldn't be giving them all these hours. But like you wake up, you're not commuting. You're like, oh, I'll make my morning coffee and answer some emails at 7 a.m. Instead of like waiting till I get my desk at nine, you know, that's two more hours of work that I did. And then being able to like, cook myself a healthy lunch instead of leaving the office to go get one and then coming back, you know, that, that was a shorter amount of time. Oh, and like, while I was making some cooking something, I was also on the phone and, you know, and so I was like multitasking a lot better and then not having to commute home at night, you know, you don't mind working an extra half an hour, an hour. So I think there was a lot of, of earned productivity, um, from workers because, they just think all the annoying parts about the office, the, the water cooler chit chat about Game of Thrones or whatever the hell it is. And like the, 
the misery of the traffic and the running to get lunch when you eliminate some of that stuff, you know, I, I do think people might be more productive. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So I want to talk real fast about entrepreneur drive and like, uh, like you said, wealth creation, right? So I'm going to shout out to my cousin, Margo and her husband, Bubba, right? So Margo, mm -hmm. she was like, um, she had like a high school degree and I can, I'm, some of this I'm making up, right? My memory is kind of fuzzy, but I feel for high school degree to master's in marketing and like in four years, right? And then her husband, Bubba, started an electrical company like 2015. So for 2015 and now they have like all these contracts around the San Antonio area. They have like a hundred employees, right? Wow. And I think of those hundred, 50 of them were able to buy houses after getting hired, right? And like, we don't talk about either, like all the wealth creation people make from entrepreneurship, like these 50 people not have houses if not this company wasn't started, right? And so the drive Bubba and Margo had to start the company, all the journeys, they told me those stories they had to do, like, you know, like doing stuff by themselves, right? And hiring these people and, and the stuff they were able to do, right? And I think we don't talk about that a lot either, right? The, the wealth creation, you know, like another story too, that they had a meme somewhere on a problem on Facebook or where, where there was like a, uh, a Lamborghini or some kind of real big car, right? Nice car. And someone said, I wonder how many people you, you could have fed if you just gave the money to charity. And the guy said, I never thought about that. I never thought about how many drivers were paid, you know, to deliver the parts or how many people that got paid for making the car, right? You know? Yeah, I mean, wealth creation is complicated. Um, it's important. It's small businesses employ the majority of Americans. And that is, you know, how the wealth is generated in our company. And I think in our country, and I think we, we do tend to glorify companies who raise a lot of money and they go public and they scale really fast or they sell to other businesses. But you know, the entrepreneur who just like works at it and grows their company and, and creates the kind of wealth that you're talking about for their, you know, their local area and their neighbors um, is really how we have economic success. And that is how the roads get paved. And yep. that's, you know, that is how the, the schools the, the, get the funded. The tax base, like you said, the coffee shops, the small restaurants around the area where the business is, you know, you know, just, it's a trip, it's a trickle down, what do you call it, the trickle effect, you want to call it, right? Yeah, well, I, that term trickle down was like, give all the millionaires the tax cuts, and then yeah. we're all, you're just going to, and I, and I hate that because we, we've all lived through, I mean, at least me, you know, I'm an 80s baby, and we've lived through those Reaganomics, and we, we certainly know that that is not exactly what's happening um, when you give the tax breaks to the corporations, they just buy back their stock and, and go in their merry way, um, but I think it's, you know, it, it is how you fund your local schools and it, and it's so important um, to make an impact and to help create wealth amongst your employees and, and to give back to your community. You know, a lot of companies also support local causes and they sponsor kids, you know, little league teams. And that's the kind of stuff that makes an impact and, and raises the quality of living for people. Like that has more of a direct impact on people's day-to-day -day lives and people's health. Um, you know, if you if you're financially stable, you tend to have better health outcomes. And that's important too. You know, you want your employees to be healthy, you want their family to be healthy. And so, you know, I have a ton of respect for people like your cousin who decided, like, let me let me run this business the right way. Exactly. So let's talk about how we met. We met through a Hofstra Veterans Challenge. Talk about that program real fast, and it's a great program. Um, so yes, Hofstra University, in partnership with one of our executives and our entrepreneurs and residents, Kevin Hesselberg and his family foundation, launched a program called the Hofstra Veterans Venture Challenge, and we are gearing up for our third annual competition, which we will launch in 2022. And what's, what's really impactful about it, I think, is that um, we're trying to serve people who served us. Um, and so we have a, a donor who understands why military backgrounds make really good entrepreneurs. The leadership skills are there. Um, the understanding of teamwork is there. The, you know, hyping up of your complementary skills and scaling up the work ethic you know, entrepreneurs who are veterans are really, really good at what they do. And I think a lot of them, you know, 
have wonderful ideas and see self-employment as a great path when they're done doing, you know, an active duty and they're done doing service for their country, they decide this is a way they can do service for their community, which makes a hell of a lot of sense. And unfortunately for a veteran population, and as Kevin and I did some research on this, we found that, you know, as if when you're out, when you join the military and you're doing active duty, you don't have as much of a business network when you leave. So it's a little harder to raise money and get access to capital. It's a little harder to build the kind of credit that you need to take large business loans. And so we said like, there's all of these amazing veteran entrepreneurs out there. And what we wanna do is have a nationwide search to find the best, most promising companies who have really scalable ideas. And we want to help give them resources. And we have a really nice uh, pot of prize money. We gave $160,000 in cash and prizes away last year. Um, and what we're really trying to do is help these businesses scale. And we want to see that kind of growth and that kind of wealth creation that we've been talking about. Um, and so, you know, we met through that program and my network, my professional network has grown so much since we launched the program. And I think What's also been really fantastic to see is that, you know, these veteran companies, veteran owned companies from around the country have this really great now network and connection with each other. And there's a few support organizations like Patriot Bootcamp, um, Bunker Labs that a lot of the companies are sort of familiar with. So there's, there's a bunch of really key people out there running programs and really supporting um, veteran owned companies. And, uh, they definitely deserve our support and respect. And, you know, it's just also smart business. You know, these companies, if you invest your money in a company that's owned by veteran, trust me, they're going to work really hard to make sure you get your return back. And so, um, you know, I, I say like, they're like almost like it's, it's more bankable than your average Joe. And it has a lot to do with their backgrounds. So is there a certain type of company you look for? Like this has to be a tech company or a manufacturing company and is it like early stage or revenue? What's like your, what's the demographic you're going after for your, your applicants? So the sweet spot is a company that's been in business no more than about three to five years that has revenue around a hundred thousand um, dollars and that the idea is scalable. So we're not really looking to support lifestyle businesses at this time. So if you have like a restaurant that's like going to feed you and your family, you know, that's great, but that's really hard to, to duplicate and scale and do the kind of wealth creation that the program is really concentrated on supporting. And so, um, so a scalable idea, and um, I will make sure that I drop all of the information about the program on my social media today so that anybody listening can check it out. And if I remember correctly, when I went through, uh, there was like a hundred, hundred applicants and then for that 100, you took it down to 20 for the semifinalists and then 10 for the finalists. And then you did pick the first, second, or third after a pitch competition, right? Yeah, we, we usually get about 100 applicants. That's uh, been the two-year average. And then we narrowed it down to 25 semifinalists. And then 10 people competed for the money. But outside of the money, um, what we really tried to do with some of the semifinalists and the finalists is really set them up with services that they can use going forward. And so we're working with a capstone business class this year, and we have students doing consulting work for free for uh, these companies that participated in the challenge, some semifinalists, some finalists. And so we're really trying to make sure that they continue to get services and resources uh, to scale up. I mean, when I went through, I guess there was some interns, they were like the freaking fantastic, right? The interns I had. I definitely think that Hofstra University has a really amazing student body. And I had the privilege of getting to interview and, and select the interns. And so I, I really picked the cream of the crop to work with these companies. But uh, Hofstra does a really good job of giving students a lot of experiential learning opportunities. So doing you know stuff in real life, not just theories in a textbook. And I think because of that, the students are really effective in, in helping the companies. They have a little more experience than your average college student. And that, you know, that has a lot to do with the fact that the business school, especially here um, and the engineering school really concentrate on, on getting that in-person real life experience before they graduate. So when you cut, cut the companies from 100 to 25, like 
I mean, it has to be a hard process, right? Like, how? Do, what do you look for? You look for is like there's certain things you're looking for from the companies. Like, I know I think I think we had to do a video. Like, there's so many variables you can go through. How do you? How do y'all decide? Or so we have a a panel of people who look over the submissions. So we ask for a video or a pitch deck or both. Um, and we're really looking for, you know, is your company unique? Is your company scalable? Do you have the experience and the background to make this company work? Um, you know, are the economics there? You know, do you have a, a business model that makes sense? Um, and so out of the hundred, it's super hard um, to, to only take 25, because of course we want to help everybody. But we also think in terms of the services that we offer, mm -hmm. we offer a lot of help around your go-to-market um, plans and strategies and a lot of help with, with marketing and advertising and a lot of, and help with some sales strategy stuff. And so, you know, if those things are already your strength and, and you need other kinds of help, you know, maybe we're not the right fit for you. So we also think about like, where can we make the largest impact? Um, so um, I really do love the program. Um, my father fought in Vietnam. My grandfather fought in World War II. Uh, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. He started a custom suit and dry cleaning store on Avenue B and 14th Street for those native New Yorkers. And he ran it for 65 years. And so, um, you know, it's also like near and dear to my heart because I, I know um, how much this population has, has given to our country and how much we owe it to them to make sure that they can continue to do that, you know, and they're always thinking about this population is, is special because they're always thinking about ways they can be of service. And I respect that. And I think, you know, everybody should be thinking about ways they can be of service through their community, but this, this population in particular really works on that. And so they also usually have in mind that wealth creation, um, that the mantra of hiring other veterans. And so, you know, that's, that's how we figure out, you know, who's going to be the most supportive going forward and where we should spend our resources. And the veteran community was, was definitely a no brainer. So the position now, the acting one will soon become permanent. What, <laughs> what are your metrics for success for the position? So I wish the university would tell me, I don't know what the metrics of success are. I, I'm assuming that I just could continue to help entrepreneurs grow and scale. Um, maybe they just wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy. I don't know. <laughs> um, and that I wouldn't burn the place down. You know, I do have a really unique background to end up in academia. You know, as, as you talked about in my bio, I started in the music business and worked in gangster hip hop, right? So it's, I'm really probably the last person um, that anybody would expect to be working in academia. And so, you know, I, maybe they just wanted to make sure I was, I was going to be appropriate. I don't know. <laughs> so talk about that. How, how does one go from working for G unit records to academia, right? That's, that's, that's a hell of a switch right there, right? That's <laughs> the giant leap. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, it's not a common career path. And I, and I do get this question a lot and I wish there was like a an easy answer. When I left the music industry, um, it was in a bad situation at work. It was, we were, our company was in an untenable situation. Um, there was giant layoffs across the board. The music industry had, had taken a, it was in a rough spot. And I left in, um, on Christmas of 2015. And I thought I didn't rush into anything. Um, I had a, a fairly soft landing. And so I, I wanted to take some time and think about what my priorities were for myself and my career going forward. And I really thought about my education and my resume and how they just didn't match in the way that people expect them to. And I, I had gotten offers right away from um, other you know, record labels and, and other recording artists. Um, you know, I got an offer from Parkwood Entertainment and God isn't like everyone's dream to work for Beyonce. And, and it was really enticing, but I just kept thinking about like the longevity of my career and the impacts I wanted to make and, and what my priorities were. And I thought, you know, I, I didn't have a proper business background and I, I was doing 
business work my entire career. Um, so I thought, you know, it would be kind of cool to get an MBA and, and really sharpen those skills and also be able to present to people um, a more full package. Um, and so I thought, all right, that's something that I'm passionate about, which is going back to school to get this MBA. And then I also thought about quality of life, which I see now, you know, companies are really struggling with their employees with. And, and when you work in the music business, it is 24 seven, right? Like people go to concerts on holidays. There's like Christmas concerts and there's New Year's Eve concerts and there's performances on Thanksgiving Eve and like all the times where like you want to be with your family and it and it's natural to expect like you might get holidays off and and those holidays just didn't exist in the context of the music industry and if you know your employer is working 24/7 365 and and the expectation is you're there to support that it's really hard to sort of to draw the line between like, what is my private personal life and what is my professional life? And I was sort of feeling like it's a really, really blurred situation where my personal identity was my job um, and that, so I really wanted to create the separation with my next move. So I thought, okay, so education, separation of, of work and who I am as a person and spending more time with my family um, were my priorities. And when I was looking for, for jobs, what sort of attracted me to the opportunity at Hofstra was like the, the most exciting part about working with 50 Cent is that he was this like insane entrepreneur, had all these business ideas and he had like a film and television company and a consumer electronics company and he had the vitamin water and we did clothing line with Mark Echo and he just had like his hands in everything and I got to work in so many business verticals and I thought, gee, it, it might be kind of boring to go work for a company that's like in one vertical all the time. And I thought, Ooh, like I could still, you know, use my expertise in all of these different areas um, and share my experience with all these entrepreneurs and help a lot of people instead of helping one person. Um, and it was cool because if you take a job and a university, you get to go back to school for free and an MBA is not cheap. And so I said, all right, I'm going to take this job and I'm going to get my MBA and I'm going to have some fun while I'm there. And, I get some real experience of work-life balance, and then I'll see what happens when I graduate. And at that point, I got promoted twice, um, and then a third time, and so I just kind of never left, uh, and I absolutely love it here. So I encourage people when they're thinking about their careers and like making a massive shift into a new kind of career, just to think about like what you're going to, you're going to be surprised, but like what jobs really represent your goals and where do you, where can you, maybe not where you can see yourself. Cause I certainly was like, this is not going to work. They're going to like, take a look at my Nike sneaker collection and like, listen to the curses that come out of my mouth or hear my hip hop blasting from my office while I'm grant writing. Like, how is this going to be sustainable? But it really aligned with my values and it really aligned with my goals. And so I said, you know, let me try what's, what's the worst thing that can happen. And it's turned out to be a super positive experience for me. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just loving it. And so I encourage people, like, even if it sounds crazy, like take a stab at it. You never know what you're going to be good or bad at until you give it a go. I'm, par I'm paraphrasing here, but I still remember the 50 cent lyric from way back in the day. I just sold a uh, Vita water for hundred million of Coke. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it took a, it took a quarter water, sold it in a bottle for two bucks. Coca-Cola came and bought it for millions. What the, uh, yeah. It, I mean, that was quite the good investment. It was a, it was a small sports drink company. It was actually worked in Queens. They were working out in Queens and they were, uh, they got an early adopter, like a gym in this in College Point, Queens, which is like not an overly, it's a pretty um, industrial part of Queens, not a ton of people living over there. It's not actually not that far from where I live now. And he tried the drink at the gym and he was like, oh, where'd this come from? And he started talking to him about the company and he was, you know, passionate about the product. He thought it was a really good product and, um, you know, using, leveraging his fame and leveraging his fan base, it, it really helped accelerate the growth. And then it got acquired by Coca-Cola and 
you know, I think that's a lot of people's dreams. If you're in the soft drink or, or a sports drink business to get acquired by a monster like that. And so, so it's great. I mean, look, I 50 cent, I don't think he wanted to be in the soft drink business long-term, but he, he had a vision and he always has a vision. You know, he's got like the number one watch show on stars right now. And like, it's really sort of like, it's slightly biographical and he pulls from like life experience and the stories that he chooses to tell, um, you know, are really authentic to who he is and his life experience and things he's passionate about. And it's really worked out well. And I, you know, he's been able to keep his audience through his transition, you know, primarily from music now to TV and film because he stayed, you know, really authentic to, to who he is. And he tells the same kinds of stories from the music uh, to the, to the TV. And I just respect that guy so much. The work ethic is, insane insane that is like no days off entrepreneur who will work he will outwork anybody i've ever met and by the way never late to a meeting like all those rapper cliches oh like they're always late no this gentleman is never late he is on time he is early and he is prepared and it is really super admirable and i think that's why he's been so successful so talk talk some about the business aspect of the entertainment industry right because there's the term the star artist right why are some artists starving or those like are successful, like, like 50 cent? And, and, and oh. is, is business the same? I'm guessing business is the same business business, right? No matter what the background, right? Yeah. Well, I think so. Music is so hard. It is such a hard business to make money at because the economics of it have changed so dramatically over the years and the economic, the streaming economics versus like selling a CD and what the profit margin is for the artist is it's really, really, really tough to just make your money doing that. And so of course, touring is another way for a recording artist to make a lot of money. Uh, but you know, it's also a hard, hard thing to be on the road all the time. And, you know, how sustainable is that? And, and, you know, you've seen it in all the rock documentaries, you know, that they glamorize the sex, drugs and rock and roll, but some of that um, hard living, you know, is because it takes a toll on your mental health. Um, like, let's be honest, people are not just using because it's fun. I think people are also using for an escape. And so it's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. And I think the people who are the most successful at it figured out, um, like 50 did, which was how do I use the fans that I make from music and have a larger lifetime value of each customer? And that meant for him selling them sneakers and selling them, you know, sports drinks and having them watch his TV show and selling them alcohol. And it was really about like differentiating your portfolio, which is like what we tell everybody when they're investing, which is like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And I think artists who are super successful a lot of the times financially really worked at having all of those other pieces of the, of the business in place and using the music as sort of the marketing for the greater success. So I think, start, and again, it's just also so hard, right? Like there's so much, so much music on Spotify. Like how does one person stand out? And it's, you know, the marketing is so important and it's, it's some of it is luck and it's just, that's a tough, tough, tough business. Um, and I think that's, that's why there's so many starving artists, you know, the, it's the economy of scale. You have to have such a vast amount of fans who are consuming your product in order to make it work. So, so funny story I thought of when I was on my station with Chins Italy back in 01, 02, 03, and 50 Cent first came out and me and some friends went to this constant Milan, right? We're like kind of, we had pretty decent seats, yeah. right? And, um, so he's doing his performance. And one of my friends says back when he had like his beef with Ja Rule, I think, I think it's the beef school going on. And my friend like said, F Ja Rule, F Ja Rule. And somehow 50 Cent heard him. And then like 20 minutes later, 50 Cent gave him, gave, gave him a pair of tennis shoes and some other stuff, right? Which was kind of cool, right? <laughs> I love this story. <laughs> it was crazy. And then, and then uh, back to entrepreneurship, like those are things somewhere where like already Grande and Beyonce sung the same concert. And it was like in different chain entrepreneur for the already granted got paid. I'm making this up, of course, like hundred thousand dollars for the concert, right? Beyonce got paid nothing, but she got all the rights to her to the everything, and she converted her her song, her concert into a Netflix movie or something, right? And of course, it made way more money, right? So why do you think some people like Beyonce and Fifty Cent 
Dr. Dre get that, so to speak, other people just interchange this like in their blood or is there like lessons learned or what do you think? I think it's just really good business management and really good management. It's, um, and it's the artists trusting the people that they hire to handle this kind of stuff for them, um, to, to see that and make those commitments. Some artists don't care, right? Like their goal is to get their art out there to be consumed by people. And like, if they make a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, as long as like, you know, they can pay everyone they need to for the tour and they can pay their own bills. They're satisfied with that. And then others um, are really, really understand how much larger their wealth could be and how that could have a larger economic impact on their community. And I think, you know, Beyonce and Jay-Z are a great example of like how they, they really concentrate on highlighting things that affect the community and they really, um, you know, draw attention to buying from other black owned businesses. And I think, you know, being, being true to themselves and supporting their community in the best way possible and using their fame and their money to do so is impactful in, in a different kind of way. So I, I guess it's really just about the person. It's about the person having the foresight and hiring the people around them to make sure that happens or, or maybe the person just does, just wants to, to play their music and go home. You know, some artists really don't care. They just, you know, and they live in obscurity half the time unless they're out there touring, right? Like Neil Young famously like lives on a ranch in the middle of nowhere. Dave Chappelle still lives in like the middle of nowhere, Ohio. Like you can't change some people. They're just not interested in it. So it's really about the person. Yeah, and then talking about mix entrepreneurship music. And I think a lot of people mix, mix, miss this. So no, Connor West, he was doing like these listening parties, right? In Atlanta. But Pritta realized he was actually like releasing the MVP, like beta one, beta two, beta three. And then after all the listening parties, what I call them beta testings and MVP releases, they release the album, right? So I think a lot of people start doing that too. Well, there's a lot. It's a great way to minimize risk because you see the audience reaction. So we used to do this with mixtapes and 50 was really famous for this, um, which is like you release a bunch of music on mixtapes and you see what your audience gravitates to. And then you spend the money and the time and the effort marketing you know, the standout hits. And so um, it's not a new idea, but I think doing it live and in person and, and creating a spectacle out of it was also like a genius marketing tactic because there was some exclusivity there. Like everybody wanted to like get into the concert so mm. they could like hear the album. So you've created like a scarcity in the environment. Yeah. Um, that's super brilliant. Uh, so, you know, like, like it or not, like the, the spectacle of it does affect the marketing and and the hype for the album. He didn't have to worry about songs playing on the radio. He didn't have to worry about going out there and and you know selling the album on a tour. So he really eliminated some of that those old school strategies that take a lot of time and effort. Um, and he just built it himself. And Kanye is like that. He's really into building it himself, you know? I mean, he builds it and they come. It's not, the things he Pretty does much. are not, yeah. Pretty I mean, much. the things he does are not by accident. And people are like, oh, he's crazy. Like, is he though? Is he yeah. crazy? Or or is that like part of the marketing tactic? I don't know the answer. I don't know him personally. Um, I've never worked closely with him. Uh, I've only met him once. So I, I have no idea, but it works and it's smart. So, so. so tell us a story of how 50 Cent convinced you to come work for him. <laughs> Wasn't hard. Um, <laughs> I was working at an accounting firm and I didn't want to be. When I got out of college, I had done an internship at Atlantic Records prior to that. And I worked in the radio department and I found out that the guys who promote radio, make music to radio all day are sort of like used car salesmen. And I got super turned off by like that particular aspect of the business. So basically when you try to get your song on the radio, and this was before Elliot Spitzer decided in New York that he was going to like bust everybody for payola. It was basically like you would get on the phone all day with all of these programmers at radio stations. And you would like tell them these stories about the music and you'd like make something up. Oh, it you know, moves me. And I cried when I heard it. And the artist is so special. And so you're like selling this thing, whether or not you believe in it or not, you've created this narrative to do it. And then you're like, 
bribing them basically um, after you weave them this story to play your music. And I was like, oh, this is, this is nothing that I want to spend my day doing. So when I graduated college, I knew like I wanted to stay somehow involved in the music industry because I, you know, I love music and I was super passionate about it. And I, I am no musician myself. And I was like, how do I stay close to the thing that I love? So um, I was looking for jobs and I, I couldn't find any jobs in the music industry that were available, that were in departments that interest me and a girl in my sorority. And this is why we say like, use your network. Her father owns an accounting firm that specialized in providing accounting and business management services to entertainers and high net worth clients. And he was like, oh, like, you know, we could work something out when you graduate, you could like, come work part-time. And I, I knew then I was going to get a master's and go back to school right away anyway. So I was like, oh, it's, you know, his accounting room is not far from my parents' house. I'll like go work there part-time. And then I will um, go to school at night and I'll finish my master's and Sometimes timing is everything. He had an employee leave right before um, I graduated. And so instead of working part-time, I was working full-time and I was working as a business manager. I was doing day-to-day -day bill paying and car buying and mortgage acquiring. And I was like, you know, I was doing tour accounting and payroll and, and all sort of things like that. And 50 was a client, um, G Unit Records was a client and they have, their record label was starting to really grow and their popularity was insane. Everything they touched turned to gold. And so, you know, it was super glamorous and exciting to me who was sitting in an accounting firm on Long Island going to school at night where you get an offer to come work at, you know, at a record label, the hottest artist, um, you know, who would say no to that? And so I, I made, I had to make that effort, uh, the, that exit really gently because I was going to work for a client of the firm. Uh, but my boss was super supportive and I stayed around and I trained my replacement at the accounting firm and I went to work at the record label and I started out, you know, doing a lot of the work that I was doing on the accounting side. It was just sort of the, the complement to that over at the record label. And as years went on, my role just kept expanding and expanding because the, you know, the money that we were bringing in was sort of shrinking and we were, everyone was having to take on more responsibility. Um, and we were sort of a startup, you know, we were trying to figure out like, how do we make this work and how do we scale this company and what are the other opportunities outside of music and, you know, how, what is our product roadmap? And yeah, it included things like selling water and selling sneakers and selling clothing, which was sort of non-traditional. And then um, eventually there was somebody who was, who was sort of functioning as an, an office manager and she left and we had grown to enough employees where our lawyers were like, you really need an HR department. Like this is not <laughs> safe or good. Um, and so I stepped up and I, I took on those responsibilities, which I really loved. I really loved, you know, being an advocate for all of the employees in the office. And, so and I, I, navigate I, I, I have to say real fast, like when you think of like gangster rep and HR, that's something <laughs> that definitely does not mix, right? You know, that's, that, that's, not, that's something you don't match you up together, right? <laughs> When I was like, we're going to have an employee handbook, I think like people laughed in my face <laughs> and they were like, the fuck are you talking about? Like, like, I, like, like no drinking at two in the morning? <laughs> I was like, no, like we, like we have to have rules. Like this is a company, like it's just not a free for all. Um, and you know, it is, the impression is like that, right? Like it's so crazy, but like I had worked with a lot of really professional people, um, you know, in order to be that successful and have all of that happening, that those kind of things happening, you do have to run the business in a super professional way. And so, um, of course, like the events that we go to at night are like really different than probably like an ADP happy hour or like, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's uh, probably a little different. Um, you know, our, our office Christmas party was probably like not the same as some accounting firms office Christmas party, but, uh, so, of course, you know, it's hard to navigate doing human resources <laughs> in a situation that's like, you know, prime for all of the inappropriate things to happen, the language, I mean, the language and the music alone could be conceived as offensive or so, you know, really it was, it was tough to navigate. Um, we had a lot of long-term employees. So in that sense, people just got it. Um, but I mean, I dealt with some really sensitive issues. We had like, transitioning genders and bathroom issues, like wild shit that you would not think 
you know, things that are probably like, there's some sort of corporate manual and are probably pretty like regular at a, at a, like a law firm where they would have like a plan for that. Yeah. We didn't have a plan for that. And so, you know, a lot of, of really leaning on our legal counsel and, and just um, having built the trust and respect of my coworkers over the years when I did step into that role and I did have to like have some of those conversations like, Hey, you know, like you have to be a little more appropriate in this way, or, you know, this could be perceived as inappropriate. Um, they got it. And, and I always tell people like, if you can earn the respect of your coworkers, you can earn the respect of your clients, you can earn the respect of your investors, you know, you, it'll be a much easier road for you and respect is mutual and respect is earned. Right. Um, and so always, it doesn't matter if you're talking to the receptionist when you walk in, the gender that cleans the toilets, or the CEO of the company, everybody deserves the same amount of respect. Um, and you should give everybody all of the respect you can until they give you a reason not to. Yeah, whatever someone asked me, like, what's to do when they start a job? I tell them, if you can, have lunch with everyone, right? The gender, the assistant aid, like whatever, at least, I, of course, a big company can't do that, but at least... And many people talk to them, figure out what they're doing, right? And let them know who you are versus like, oh, I'm a VP or whatever. I'm a director or whatever, you know, you got to make people like you. At least if they don't like you, respect you, you know, yes, like yeah. I, I have a good enough relationship with um, the, oh God, I don't know if it's a janitor is probably not the right term, but a custodial engineer that works <laughs> in my space that like when I need something on the fly, instead of having to go into our work order system and request it 24 hours in advance, I have a cell phone number. I'll call him up and he'll come help me. Yes. And so, you know, that though, when you build relationships, you're able to navigate situations and get things done more efficiently. And, um, you know, it's your network and your relationships are always going to be the thing that sets you apart from other people. So we talk about how, how entrepreneurs have to work hard. Let's talk real fast about how luck plays a lot of the two, right? You're like, I mean, this example, like Eminem got turned on by Dr. Dre because Dr. Dre just happened to see his, his mixtape, right? Or something like that. And so Eminem blew up. And then later on, Eminem just happened because he's blown up. He happened to see 50 Cent mixtape, right? Whatever. And like how you like, how the entrepreneurs like, it's hard to work and it's luck too, right? Can you talk about that some? Well, I think mentorship, is really important. I think if you're in a position, if you're an entrepreneur and you've had some level of success, it's really important that you give back and you should take on a mentee who's doing something similar to you or in your space and your vertical. Um, and you should spend some time with them and try to help them not make some of the mistakes that you made and, and try to help them expand their network. And I think the same goes for if you're starting out, like it's, it's okay to ask for help and it's important to ask for help. And it's going to alleviate, you know, a lot of mistakes. It's going to save you money. It's going to save you time. Um, having a network of people who have been there before and done it. And so at Hofstra, we've set up um, a mentor network and we have an entrepreneur in residence program. And we really try to encourage students to utilize uh, all of the people that have all this amazing expertise and people love to mentor other people. You know, it's, it's good for their ego. Uh, they want to share what they've accomplished. They like to feel need, like needed and respected. And so um, it's, it's not, I don't think it's hard to find a mentor that has the experience that you need. I think it's hard to establish the long-term relationship. And I think that, you know, that's always something that both parties have to work at and, and be passionate about. But, you know, I, so I, I encourage, you know, people to, to find mentors, to go to meetups um, and, and to really expand your business network and to lean on people. People will help you. You know, if you're having issues in HR in your company, you know, I've got this friend, Jason, he's got lots of experience. Like, I'm sure he'd take my call. You know, recently my grandfather was having some issues with his like personal aid. And like I knew a company, a veteran owned company through our program that specialized in helping people access their VA benefits for health, home health aids. And like, because I run this program and I was nice to this company and I helped this entrepreneur, he sat on the phone with my 97 year old grandfather and the VA for like two hours to try to get it straightened out. And so like, it helps in your personal life. It helps in your professional life. Um, so always, you know, get a mentor, expand your network. 
And you'd be surprised. People will help. They are happy to do so. Yeah, a lot of people, they have this, this negative perception, oh, no one's going to help me. But in my experience, at least 80% of people ask for help, have helped me, right? Or at least connect me with someone else, right? Because people want to help, you just got to ask, right? You have to ask for help. Yeah. And then um, back to Eminem 50 Cent, I remember watching uh, when 50 Cent got his uh, star on the Walk of Fame, they called. And Eminem <laughs> was like the, like the guest speaker or whatever, presenting him. And you just tell what a big fan Eminem was of 50 Cent, right? This is a relationship, like the mentor, even though the mentor mentor, you just tell like, how much Eminem was happy. And I think a lot of us need to be more happy for other people's success. I mean, yeah, don't be a hater, right? Like we should all be celebrating each other. Unfortunately, I am part of 51% of the population who sucks at this. Women, I do not find to, to be an overly supportive group. There's a whole bunch of women out there saying like, we have to support each other. And then like, you know, you go out to, brunch and like three mimosas in they're like shitting on every female friend they have and you're like girl that is not the message we are trying to send here um and it is it is important to celebrate everyone's success and, and to be really supportive you know i think people have spent a lot of time tearing companies down or insulting their competitors um they're just projecting right it's their own insecurities and they're just projecting your competitor can be helpful to you. If your competitor is a few steps ahead of you and they get a customer that's too small for them, they don't want to take them on, they might refer them to you if you had a decent relationship and, and you relied on one, one another and you worked together. And so, you know, I think for Eminem, who at one point had struggled, you know, very publicly with addiction, 50 had accompanied him to some interviews and maybe bailed him out a few times when he didn't feel like being so vocal. Uh, you know, and I think, 50s made a lot of money for Eminem over the years. Yeah. And so having that, you know, that mutual respect and that, you know, that relationship is really important. Um, and I try really hard to encourage women. So I mentor a bunch of women, young women who work in the music industry, um, cause I have experience there and I stay in touch with a lot of the Hofstra student entrepreneurs who have graduated and gone on to start companies. We started a next gen advisory group where I work with these newly graduated alums and alumni and they come back and they work with my students and help mentor them. And so, you know, really trying to, again, always expand that network and stay in touch. And, and I just try to be helpful to everybody. You never know when you're going to need somebody or a hand and to have a giant, what they used to call Rolodex, but now I guess contacts and a cell phone um, of people with varying abilities and skill sets and networks is, is so incredibly useful. And so, you know, I just, just respect everybody, lean on people asking for help, saves you time, saves you money, saves you aggravation. Um, and, and it builds community, right? Like what, I don't know who said it, but it was like, takes a village to raise a child, right? Like I, we just had a horrible storm in New York and you know, people living in basement apartments were getting flooded out and people were trapped in the subway. And, you know, it does, it takes a village just to live in New York. You know, you got to help your neighbors. You got to check in on people and just being a good citizen, I, I think is value. And especially has value as an entrepreneur because, you know, the guy on my apartment floor helped me out one night when I got locked out. And then he starts some sort of business where I would be a customer. I'm his first customer. Mm -hmm. Like this guy helped me out. I'm I'm an early adopter. I'm you sign me up. Like you're a nice dude. I'm I'm gonna support you. Guy across the hall from me is a video editor. He edited some film or something for HBO Max. Would I normally have watched it? No. But do I like the guy? Yes. Has the guy picked up my mail for me? Sure. Did he water my plant for you when I was on vacation? Yeah. So I'm watching a show, right? Like it or not, I'm watching a show. And so I think like that's also important when you start a business is your personal reputation, whether or not people like you, whether or not people respect you is also going to be the difference as to whether or not they buy from you. Yes. Yes. So next question from your point of view, is it advantage or disadvantage to being a female entrepreneur? So I'm not an entrepreneur, so I don't know that I'm qualified to answer this. Um, I think women are just always going to have a harder time raising capital because there's less female VCs. For some reason, the statistics show that women have a harder time raising money. But the statistics also show that women are a safer bet to, to invest your money with. 
So I don't, I don't really yeah. know where the, the, where numbers the, don't add, the, the, number, the numbers don't add up. Yeah. I don't know. So I, I think there's, there's always going to be sexism and misogyny. Um, that, that doesn't seem to go anywhere. I think Texas just, just made a huge statement that, uh, women are just not going to be fully respected to make their own life decisions. We're, we're just, you know, they're just, they're just maybe not, not there yet. <laughs> like evolution. I think back to, you know, my grandmother, when she was first married, she couldn't have her own bank account without her husband or her father being a signer on it. And she couldn't have a passport. Like these are things that were not available to women in my grandmother's lifetime. And like how insane that sounds. Now I am, you know, acting executive dean at a university. I was director of finance of a multi-million dollar record label. And so, you know, progress, fantastic. And there are amazing women entrepreneurs who have absolutely killed it. You look at like Oprah and Sarah Blakely and there's, you know, and then we have bad eggs like Elizabeth Holmes, not really helping out the cause, but there's, there's tons of fantastic women entrepreneurs and um, women are going to face just like men, just like people of color. Like there's always going to be some amount of people who are just not going to be supportive and there are going to be people who are. And I think, you know, if you, if you have a good enough product or service, if you're solving a big enough problem, if you're authentic, if you're honest, if you do good work, if you're a decent person, I think you'll have success regardless of all of those challenges. Um, maybe some are going to have to work harder at it than others, but I think everybody, you know, who does the right thing gets there. Can you talk some about your role as the e-advisory council member for the National Center for Disability Entrepreneurship? So that's something I'm really super passionate about. Um, the employment numbers for people with disabilities are abysmal. And I think it's really unfortunate. Um, you know, the veteran community, no different. People come back from active duty and, and they are now living with a disability that maybe they didn't have before. Uh, and employers are expected to make reasonable accommodations. And I think in a lot of ways that they, they just panic when they see a person with a disability, maybe they aren't familiar with them, or maybe it's it's a pop part of the population they haven't worked with much or, or no, but, um, but people with disabilities are people too, and they're just as capable as everyone else. And so um, because there has been such um, an issue with them finding employment for absolutely ridiculous reasons and, and bias and prejudice, self-employment has been a huge part of the way that the community of persons with disabilities has found a way to, to support themselves and, and to provide job opportunities for people just like them who, or maybe have different disabilities. Um, so I think the work that they're doing at the Viscardi Center is that they're providing resources and a program to help people who have a disability and have a business idea, move their business idea forward and, and get access to funding and get some mentorship. And I, I think it's really important to support any entrepreneur, regardless of, you know, their background and regardless of if they're living with a disability. I think it's, it's you know, it's important that I do as much as I can to support every entrepreneur, because again, it goes back to wealth creation. It goes back to being a good community member. It goes back to increasing the tax base of my neighborhood and where my, you know, I work and where I live. And so if these entrepreneurs can create jobs and, and they can create wealth, um, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. So I, I help out, I mentor some of the companies and I try to help them out with their customer discovery and try to guide them through the process and um, try to help them get some access to funding. Sharon, how do you take care of yourself? So I work out every, I work out Monday through Friday. Uh, for half an hour to 45 minutes. I sleep eight hours a night. Come hell or high water, I get that sleep. Um, I try to eat healthy like 80% of the time, 20% of the time that ice cream is just calling my name and no one's perfect. Um, and I, Saturday nights and Tuesday nights, I have date night with my husband. And so those are sort of the self-care things that I do um, and the things that are important to me and the things that I carve time out for to take care of myself. Sharon, is there anything else that I asked you that I didn't, or is there anything else you want to talk about that we didn't cover yet? 
I can't believe how quickly the time went. I was so nervous this morning. I'm like, I don't know if I could talk this much. And I don't know if I have anything important to say. I mean, I mean, if we're honest, we could probably talk another two or three hours if we're honest, right? I don't know. But I, I think I think you did a fantastic job interviewing me. You certainly got a wide range of responses for me on a lot of topics. And so I um I had a, I had a bunch of fun today. I hope that I was a decent guest. Oh yeah, you're a great guest. Um, so can you share your social media so people can reach out to you? Sure. So it's, um, on Instagram and on Twitter, it is at Sharon, I E N the number eight. So S H A R O N I E N and the number eight. Um, and the reason for that is because a very long time ago when I was in junior high school, I had a bunch of friends that started calling me Sharonian. I have no, <laughs> it was like this like nickname of affection that they had. It was, I guess, like cuter than Sharon. It was Sharonian. And so that's, it's stuck and I'm, I'm born on July 8th. So, so that is where that is from. And I can't shake it. Um, and then I had a coworker who started calling me Sharoni. I don't know. It's just like, I can't get rid of these stupid nicknames. I guess because Sharon's like not a kind of name that's like fun to make short. Yeah, like Jason could be Jay or yeah. like, yeah, I don't, I, it doesn't work. So, so, so they got creative and made it longer. <laughs> nice. And to our listeners, we'll have our social media links in our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinshtallblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends on your favorite podcast platform. So Sharon, we're coming in with a talk. Can you give us any wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? Just, I would, my new mantra is everyone love everyone. Just be a decent person. Go out there today and be nice to somebody who doesn't have a smile on their face um, and, and try to just spread love. Sharon, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. I had a really great time. I hope you have a good day. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Uh